Mato Anomalies, a weird turn-based RPG on modern systems that surprised players with its release. It got a lukewarm reception unfortunately, but some initial issues it had were fixed. So now that I finally played it and finished it, I'm here to share my review based on the PS5 version. And also to tell you that, well, I may be the only person on the internet that liked this game. Apparently, this is an indie RPG. I'm honestly surprised because a lot of people worked on it, and even actors like Christina V joined the English cast, which is pretty damn good, by the way. Whatever the case, it's a game by Chinese studio Arrowis. One extremely unique neo noir story about a private detective named Doe. Yeah, like John Doe, except his name is just Doe, with adult dialogue and mature situations. Basically, it takes place in the future where a few cities are controlled by a unified government, robot police and advanced AI. Yeah, a dystopia to say the least. However, underground layers created by the collective negative emotions of humanity have been born. The Bane Tide are bizarre metaphorical creatures that inhabit them, so Doe has to do something about them because they're intrinsically connected to a horrible conspiracy in the real world. But he can't fight the Bane Tide. He meets Graham then, who can actually fight them, among other characters that will join as the game progresses. If it sounds like and looks like Persona to you, forget it. It did get a lot of comparisons to those games, but no, it is and plays vastly different from Persona. So in a nutshell, you'll be controlling Doe in the different small places of Mato, each with different shops and bases of operations and NPCs, etc. The story will advance from there as you progress, including in these interesting comic-like sequences with terrible lip-sync, I admit, but you know what, that's okay. Visuals are beautiful and detailed for an alleged indie game. They certainly capture an atmosphere of noir detective story. I really like the graphics in this game, the art style, the character design, some technical hiccups may be present like quick and short frame drops but never hindering the experience. And the soundtrack is fantastic, it's pretty chill combining blues with new wave with relaxing sounds and instruments that fit the world pretty well. Very worth listening to outside of the game, as most of the town themes will easily grow on you. Even the battle themes start becoming interesting after several times because at the beginning they might sound a little bit boring, but later, yeah, they grow on you. Maybe not the dungeon themes, which is my only musical complaint. Speaking about dungeons, the game was criticized because of its dungeon design as it is kinda bland, repetitive and with regular puzzles, but I don't know, I liked it and I have no complaints with it. But yeah, every single dungeon has a similar layout to the one you're seeing right now. And of course, there are tons of optional and side quests layers that you'll traverse here. No random encounters exist, yeah. Enemies are stationary though and act as roadblocks. You need to defeat most of them to make progress, but there aren't too many and they don't respawn unless you exit the dungeon and return. Combat is turn-based with up to four active allies, but well, check this out. Everyone shares the same HP bar. Yeah, they all have individual stats, of course, but those stats only stack to create a consensus for the health bar. As a result, the game's ridiculously difficult even on normal mode, and also as a result, the game's a grindfest. There are easy and hard modes as well, and an auto battle feature. Anyway, every character can equip one or two different types of weapons and their skills will vary because of that, but all of them have a bunch of native skills since the beginning. However, every single skill has a cooldown that can last for a few turns and that cooldown carries over after battle, so keep that in mind. Don't worry though, as each character has a regular attack with no cooldown whatsoever, so it'll always be available. And of course, enemies have strengths and weaknesses to certain types of attacks, which is also another reason why the game's incredibly difficult. But there is no defend option in the menu, so you'll have to rely on buffs, debuffs and dodge stats to avoid damage. Finally, everyone has an individual special attack for massive damage that fills up with that purple bar as you attack and receive damage, but using one character's special attack depletes it, 
That's right, just like the HP bar, this purple bar is also shared amongst the party. You also need to be strategic about that and decide which character's special attack is best for this or that situation. Overall, I really like this combat despite being incredibly difficult. <laughs> Skill trees are available for every character, every time you level up, everyone will get one skill point that you can use to unlock new passive or battle abilities. Like I said before, and as you can see, everyone's got their own stats. Then there's the gear system, you'll find different gears in the dungeons that have different buffs and status increases, and you'll be able to equip up to 9 of them. These ultimately affect the shared HP bar the entire party has. The interface looks easy to use, but it's not. It's a bit of a chore to unequip gears or replace them, to be honest, but you know what, it's just a minor complaint. Anyway, there are two more things to explain about this game. Doe can't fight in the layers, but he can definitely do so in the real world. Sometimes to make an NPC talk or get information out of them, Doe will play this weird turn-based card system with them. In here, enemies will attack you during their turn, but their stats and actions are determined by those spheres you see there, which are the demons. You have three action points to attack per turn, and each card, be it a defense stack buff or a skill or a regular attack, costs points. Once you've used them up, it's time to end your turn and decide if you want to keep the cards you didn't use or reshuffle the deck. This combat was heavily criticized by reviewers, and I clearly see why. It's convoluted, difficult, with tons of weird explanations about persuasion powers and whatnot, and tons of cryptic penalties for the cards and the demons! Thankfully, after three attempts, each battle can be skipped without affecting the story whatsoever or any penalties to your playthrough whatsoever. You know, it's like the developers knew this combat would make the world complain about it. So thanks to this skip feature, I have no real complaints with this combat, but it feels frustrating to have to skip it because you couldn't figure out how to win, and the easy mode doesn't seem to apply to them. These battles are excruciatingly hard and cryptic no matter what. So, overall, I have no real major complaints, except for one. The dialogue. It's a modern game, so that means it has some political crap here and there, but with it being such an obscure RPG, I couldn't find if the localization team was responsible for it, or the writers themselves wrote it like this. Miss, for example, I'm pretty sure it was developed as a lesbian character regardless of the translation, but Butterfly, for example, she can act in a very strange way around her sometimes, so I don't know if I don't know what's going on there. Thankfully, all of this doesn't ruin the experience, and there's barely any modern political remarks throughout the story, unlike other RPGs nowadays. Though I admit that the story is the best part of it, including Edelweiss as my favorite character. I love this woman. It's very hard to follow. It's intellectual, philosophical, like Xenogears, for example, but also 10 times more confusing. That's yet another big criticism the game received. People out there saying it makes no sense. Well, it made sense to me, not 100%, because as I mentioned, sometimes it was just hard to follow. But most major events and plot points were easily understood by me. I think it's because I've read, watched, and played through stories like these many times before. I was definitely the target audience for this game. Well, maybe except for its confusing, wokenized crap. But apart from that, it's got excellent narrative. I really, really like this game. The visuals, the music, the combat, and I still can't believe it was done by an independent studio. I can see why a lot of reviewers out there trashed it, including a lot of players and fans of it, but man, I just thought they went overboard. The game's nowhere near as bad as they make it out to be, in my opinion. I do recommend it, even though I see it's not gonna be for everybody. But hopefully, if you decide to play it, you'll still be able to appreciate it for what it is. It's available on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, Nintendo Switch, and of course, PC. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe, and share this video with your friends. See you next time!